Uh, okay, thanks very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here, and thanks to the organizers for organizing it, and congratulations again to Mike and Eric. Um, so the, my title is, was sort of basically a placeholder title, because I wasn't, I wasn't sure what, exactly what I was going to talk about. But um, it's, as far as I can remember, I, th I think the first time I met Eric was at a, at a BART station in Berkeley, walking to the um, stock, stock conference that year. Uh, so that's a while ago, I guess. And he might have looked younger than that then. <laughs> so, um, so I've had the pleasure of um, collaborating with Eric on, on two papers. And um, so I was just sort of, you know, thinking about what to talk about. Um, and especially, I mean, this has been a, you know, just a crazy time since, I, I guess I was, the last time I saw Eric before this was at a conference in, in Berkeley, the Simons Institute, which happened to be the week of the last presidential election. And so it was just, and in the middle of that week, you know, something very bizarre happened. And, <laughs> and the, uh, I think the whole group really sort of coalesced. It was, it was, like, it was like we went through a um, this kind of trauma together. Um, and now, you know, I feel like, you know, what I like to do is really mathematics, you know, proving things about, you know, getting a kind of certainty when we can about things. And then there's the whole outside world where this concept of truth seems to be dwindling. And, you know, so I was, I'm just, I'm just thinking in our spare time, maybe we can do something about bringing truth back to, uh, to the real world as best we can, but I'm not today. And today I'm just going to I'm just going to talk about <laughs> mathematics. Um, and I've always been I guess since I started uh, I was working on my PhD and my advisor was Eurus Hartmanis and he was quite interested interested in this concept of reductions and the fact that reductions could be so simple. So so. Um, this is what I wanted to talk about. So originally, let's say, Cook in uh, 1971 proved that SAT is NP-complete. And he used the most natural reduction, which was polynomial time Turing reductions, you know, which is really the most natural thing to do. And then shortly afterwards, Karp noticed that many, many important combinatorial problems were actually NP-complete. And he used, um, he used poly polynomial time many one reductions. Uh, which, sorry, which we draw that way, less than or equal to sub p. And then other people like Neil Jones pointed out, oh, you know, log space reductions are good enough. These problems stay complete via log space reductions. And then I guess my first technical paper was with, um, with Uris and Steve Mahaney. And we noticed that the one way log space reductions, that's reductions in which the Turing machine just reads its input from left to right and never goes back. That's enough to, um, for all these problems to stay complete. At least all the, you know, all the problems Cart mentioned, there, you know, there were more and more NP-complete problems as, as, you, as we've gone along. And then when I wrote my thesis in 1980, I was looking at using logic to understand complexity and, and later be came to be called descriptive complexity. And I know the very nice, very natural translation in logic is interpretations between theories, which is just a first order sentence that translates one problem to another, a fixed first order sentence. And that's the reduction. So those are first order reductions. And, and later we notice that first order is the same thing as uniform AC0. So for those people who prefer circuits to for sort of logic, you can you can say who would those people be? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them are here, like me, <laughs> me and Dave. I don't see Howard Straubing here, but yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, so it's just we're a small group of people looking at this stuff. <laughs> and um, so first order reduction suffice, which just seems remarkable. They're really weak, and I thought, okay. This is the, like the weakest reduction ever. And then, um, 
Max Sipser pointed out to me, oh, well, Valiant has a much weaker reduction, namely projections, which you're familiar with. Projections are standardly considered non-uniform, but, but a projection has no computation whatsoever. As Mina was talking about projections yesterday, they just basically translate each bit of each bit of the output sequence is just comes from at most one bit of the input. You either take the bit or the negation of the bit or fix zero or one. So projections are incredibly weak and very appropriate for algebraic settings. They're just no computation at all, but they're non-uniform. So I thought, okay, well you can take first order reductions that are also projections. So the uniformity is first order and the reduction is project projection. So. Um, and later, I hadn't thought about this time, later in, in a later paper with Eric uh, and Agrawal and Rudish, they, they called these, um, they pointed out these are, these are first order uniform NC0 reductions. So in the lowest level of NC0, there's actually no gates. Um, so these are pretty weak. And yet, remarkably, you know, all those complete problems all the complete problems basically in Gary and Johnson, as far as we know, I'm pretty sure this is true, stay complete via first order projections. Kind of bizarre. Um, and and um, you now Ladner pointed out, okay, so there's, I guess I'll talk a little bit more about this dichotomy phenomenon, which, which I'm really, really interested in. The idea you take a, you take a standard problem, computational problem that you want to work on. I do know, you know, you take a natural problem, it tends to be complete for one of our favorite complexity classes. You know, like, like no more than 10 complexity classes. All the problems that really arise that are natural, whatever that means. I, mean, I don't know if that natural is hiding a lot of unfair stuff. And of course, La I'm sorry, Ladner showed, um, using delay diagonalization that this you can construct artificial problems that are not complete right but they don't seem to come up too much so I would like to understand the phenomenon better um, so this sorry, so that's this dichotomy phenomenon and um, so natural problems um, stand tend to be complete and in particular um, so this was a nice exposition of that as the fader Vardy um, dichotomy conjecture for, for constraint satisfaction problems. They conjecture for all constraint satisfaction problems where the, at least where the universe is finite. So, uh, so is it, is it now? Well, I don't know. It's from the archive. I mean, it's, I mean, so, so is it really? I, I, I didn't look at it, but it's <coughs> not the, Yeah, it seems to be, it seems to be next up, yes. Yeah, it seems to be solved. So yeah. I yeah. thought you were going to say it. No, 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 I didn't, I haven't read it either. So I figured, yeah. I figured, you know, I figured you would be here, you could say. Exactly what was solved. Say what? What was solved. The constraint satisfaction, the better body conjecture is true. The dichotomy conjecture for constraint satisfaction problem. So every constraint satisfaction problem is either in P or N P complete. So the better body conjecture, this no. What does every mean? Every constraint satisfaction problem. You can formulate those in the language of better body. Right. Oh, okay. So it's. Yeah. Oh, if, I mean, if you have, like, I, I won't go there right now, but, but it's, um, it's a nice, very standard set of problems, including a whole bunch of very standard NP-complete problems like three-colorability and so on. Um, and yeah, I saw this in archive, you know, but I didn't, again, didn't read it either, but. Yeah, yeah. that is one of the options. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that. So he seems pretty trustworthy. Um, <laughs> Okay, so that's now true, which is um, which is very cool. And it was originally this originally came from a paper by Schaefer, where he showed that for for just for Boolean problems, there was that dichotomy in '78. And then the other paper I have with um, with Eric um, basically shows that not only is there a dich the dichotomy just says it's either NP complete or it's in P, but in fact it's a multicotomy. For the ones in P, they're either P complete or they're NL complete or they're L complete, or they're complete for parity P or you know, just a few other things, or they're or L, or they're trivial. And um, so it's a funny phenomenon which I'd really love to understand better. Anyway, um, then 
um, Hartmanis and, and his student Len Berman had looked at the fact that all the, they observed that all the NP-complete problems, say in Gary and Johnson, were, were isomorphic. And they were looking at polynomial time reductions in polynomial time isomorphic. Um, so there's a, there's a one one onto polynomial time computable and polynomial time, the inverse is also polynomial time map between each two of those problems. So there's only one NP-complete problem, at least in Gary and Johnson, from, from this point of view, which is very interesting. And they conjectured, oh, this should be true in general. But of course, that conjecture implies that P is different from NP, for example, still, still completely open. Okay. And um, so, but when I was in grad student, Eurus was really interested in that. My friend Steve Mahaney was another student of Eurus's, was also really interested. Um, and and did some work on that. Um, anyway, um, I was at a dog stool sometime with with Eric and and Jose Balcazar, and we showed. Um, okay, so all NP complete sets that are complete under first order projections, these very weak reductions, are in fact first order isomorphic, and that's true not only for NP but. Um, but any kind of nice standard complexity class. So, so I was, I was pleased by that, and and Eurus was pleased. I, you know, I, I felt like okay, we've proved, we proved the isomorphism conjecture or some version of it. There's really only one complete problem for each class. I don't hear too many people talking about this that much. So this way, I wanted to bring it back because I, I really like this result, and, uh, and I'll talk about the proof. The proof is simple, and then I'll talk about some improvements that Eric. Did in, in a later paper, um, and I, you know, I'd be interested to your reactions to that, because for me, it's a funny phenomenon like the dichotomy phenomenon, and um, <coughs> so some, so comments and questions, you know, some of you already obviously are free to have noticed that they're free to ask questions, but I'm, I'm I appreciate anybody's comments and questions for this, um, so. All NP complete sets in Gary and Johnson. So I just wanted to talk about where did the proof come from? How did Berman and, Hart Berman and Hartmanis do this? Um, well, they looked at an analogy. There was a theorem of Myhill's. I don't know if you remember this. That all Ari complete sets are isomorphic, and and they took that and and sort of looked at an analogy in the same sort of way about NP complete problems. And it comes from uh, a proof of the Schroeder Bernstein theorem. Schroeder Bernstein theorem, I'll just remind you, says let A and B be any two sets whatsoever. And suppose there's a 1 1 map from A to B. So the card, in some sense, the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B. And there's a 1 1 map from B to A. So the cardinality of B is less than or equal to the cardinality of A. Then from those two 1 1 maps, you can construct a 1 1 onto map between A and B. So they have the same cardinality. So, so that theorem says if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, then the cardinality of A equals the cardinality of B, which is a nice, nice theorem to know. Um, do you guys remember the proof of this? <laughs> How many people remember the proof of it? Wow, a lot. How many people don't? <laughs> Only a couple. OK, OK, I, let me just flash through it, because it's a really pretty proof. The, um, basically, um, if you look at all the elements in A union B, I'll say that A is an ancestor of C if you can go from A to C by continuing applying these functions F and G. And then you can count how many ancestors somebody has. And then you can define this 1, 1, onto map in this really simple way. Basically, H of A, well, if, if, if A has an odd number of ancestors, then, it, then it's the image of G, so I'll pull back on G. If there's an even number of ancestors or an infinite number, I can go forward, I can always go forward with F. So, so this is obviously well defined, and it's easy to show that this is a 1 1 onto map. So, so that's the proof of the Schroeder Bernstein theorem. Very cool. Right? And, um, and, and that's what Berman and Hartmann has used to show that all the NP complete sets in Gary and Johnson are polynomial time isomorphic. First, um, they proved a sort of version of the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem where they said 
Uh, so let f be a polynomial time many one reduction from a to b, and let g be a polynomial time many one reduction from b to a, and assume further that f and g are one one and length increasing. So they take each input they map to a larger thing, and as we'll see, that's very easy to achieve with 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 reductions for you know for NP-complete problems. Then. Then they showed that, therefore, A is P isomorphic. And the proof is just the previous Schroeder Bernstein proof. You can do that in polynomial time. Since it's length increasing, you only have at most a linear number of ancestors. So you can just go find them, count, and decide whether they go forward or backwards. So basically, this proof from the previous slide is doable in polynomial time, just assuming that those reductions were 1, 1 in length increasing. Is that OK? OK. So th and then. Um, they just observed, OK, notice that, um, that most NP-complete problems have what they called a polynomial time padding function, or a pair of padding functions. E is the padder, and D is the decoder. So basically, if you have some W, so that's, that would be the input, and then you have some other string x, you can, um, you can take W and encode it as W plus x. And and basically, W satisfies this, pr this complete problem A if and only if E of W and X does. Whereas you can decode E of W and X and get back W and get back X if you wanted to. And the length of E, W, X is, is longer than the length of W and longer than the length of X. So basically, you can take any input and, and pad it with some stuff. So for example, um, for um, satisfiability, if W is your formula, I can just pad it with, a, with, with length of x copies of true. You know, and, the, and the formula is exactly equivalent. So this is w satisfiable if only if this is satisfiable. So all the NP-complete problems in Gary and Johnson, it's easy to see, admit this kind of padding. You know, it would be a weird problem that you really couldn't do that kind of strange padding to. Doesn't need the padding be 1, 1? Say what? Doesn't need the padding to be 1 to 1? Um, so the, um, yeah, I, I guess, so maybe I, yeah, let me have another, let me have a description, let me have both descriptions. So I can pull back, I can pull back W and I can pull back X. Right, that's your example. Um, my example doesn't pull back, right, so, oh, sorry. You could do that just by swapping. Oh, thank you. No, yeah, that's absolutely right. So, so right, so, um, as I was reading this, uh, right, the example did it, and I didn't bother. They said, why did they bother doing that? So thank you. <laughs> so basically what they did is if the ith bit of x is a 1, I'll do a y or y bar. If it's a 0, I'll do a y bar or a y. Then I can pull it back. Thank you very much. So yes, I wanted to be right. OK, so this is nice. What a nice, what a nice uh, audience we have here. Um, so, so both. Um, so what? Turn the facts. Yeah. Well, I do. Uh, yeah. Well, rather than alternative facts, okay. I, you know, anything you see on the slide, you know, it's just a hint of what's true. <laughs> that's that's, you know. But we can come together and decide exactly what's true, and we can all agree very quickly. And that's that's what we like about mathematics. And um, okay, so there's an encryption. There's a decryption that gets you back x. That's really a better thing to have said here. It's true you can get back w, but you can also get back x. So it's 1, 1, and length increasing. So basically what that means is you can take any reduction, and you can add that stuff to make it 1, 1, and length increasing. And then you get the berman hammer manage result. Great. Um, so this, uh, that's really, so thank you. I, I mean, at least Lance and Eric, I think a lot of you are, are up on this stuff after all these years. So, <laughs> so I appreciate that. And um, OK, so all the NP-complete sets in Gary and Johnson, at least, have p-time padding functions. Therefore, they're all pol polynomial time isomorphic. OK, so that is interesting. But, but Hermanus wanted to prove it for all NP-complete sets. And so I just have a troublesome question. Go, go. So all these lemmas that all the NP complete problems in Gary Johnson have property X, Y, or Z. Right. So did somebody actually check that? Well, well, so right. So so Len Berman was the grad student at the time, so he was supposed to have gone through and checked that. Yes. <laughs> 
And perhaps it's an aesthesis. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but if you think about it, I mean, try doing it for a few. And after a few pages, you, after a few pages, you, get, you get bored. So did he really do it? Did he really do it? And if so, did Hartmanis check it? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I've I've you know I've done the similar sort of similar claims for 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 sort of projections, which are more annoying, and it's so it seems like these kind of properties are you know it's very odd it would be very strange for for a normal natural problem not to not to have to admit these kind of things. No, I'm, I'm not questioning yeah. it at all. I was just, more just wondering whether... Who actually did that? And did anyone, and, and as far as I know, now this would be a good example combining different fields, would be some, if someone would automatically you know, produce it, um, a, a cock proof of all of these things. But um, Well, define what properties of the problem that Gary and Johnson you need. Hey. Right. Well, that's very that's very easy. Uh, yeah. 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 So it's uh, really a matter of it being in, you know, a, 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 a certain uniformity to the problems. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And it's you could almost say right. You could even want to define natural problem and then prove that all natural problems have this property. There's only one really succinct problem in Gary and Johnson that's reduction to incompletely specified automata. It's the only one for which the Pippinger PPSD lower bound carries through to show it's not in deterministic linear time. Uh -huh. So I think if you check that one, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a certain a certain relation between the, the sparsity of these problems. OK. So any other, does everyone understand what we're talking about? So Dave? Just to, uh, this is probably a stupid question, but you said that it's p time given something. So, so given I have these length increasing functions, right? right? So I, now I want an arbitrary x, and I want to find out whether it's an odd or even number of ancestors? Right. OK. How do I do that? So these are invertible. And so you just you just so these um, the panning function is invertible. No, but, but so it, it, oh, the reduction will also be invertible. The, the reduction is invertible. Okay. You can just go back. Yeah, because of that. Right, right, that's obvious. Yes. Thank okay. You. So you just go back. It's a linear sequence. Okay. Okay. Good. No, it's. I mean, I appreciate questions. Okay. Let me go on. So um, so that was Berman Hermanus, and then um, so what we proved what uh, Eric and. Um, Jose Balcazar and I proved is that this works for for first order projections. Okay, so our theorem was that all NP complete sets that are complete via first order projections um, are are first order isomorphic. You can build that isomorphism, and it's true for all all reasonable complexity classes. And we didn't have a good definition for reasonable, but in Eric's later paper, there's a good definition for reachable, so I'll tell, uh, re reasonable, so I'll tell you what that is later. OK, so the key lemma for, for the FOP isomorphism theorem was this, that, um, that if I have a first sort of projection um, from from A to B, and it's it's one one, which I can make in a similar way. It's easy to make it one one, and so for sort of projections, um, map size of structures to to structures in a way that if you start with the universe, the universe of the other structure are k tuples from the universe of the original structure. So if the the arity is is the is is what is k. There, so if the area is at least two, then you're at least squaring the size of the structure. So we wanted not only length increasing, but squaring, and so so basically, it's easy enough to to build these projections that are um, one one and squaring, and and if you have that, then it's easy to check if an inverse exists from projections. That's very easy. Because a projection, each thing depends on only one bit. So it's easy to check that, e that that's correct. And you can count the number of ancestors, because the size of them is cut in half each time. So you can, just, you can just guess one witness of the whole chain. That's why we want it square. OK. So then, um, then the, the same proof in before follows. OK. So there was, um, so I was, I was very pleased with this. Um, for nice, all nice complexity classes, all complete sets via FOPs are first order isomorphic. And for me, that meant morally, you know, this is, uh, 
my former advisor's conjecture that he was fussing about the whole time as a grad student is true. Yeah. But, um, and um, so each nice complexity class has only one complete problem. I don't hear about that very much. For, uh, I think it's a really fundamental thing about complexity. But, um, and again, as I said, there's this dichotomy phenomenon that the natural problems tend to be complete via for sort of projections. And, and it's really great for everybody who does algorithms and complexity, because it means there's only a very few problems that you have to get these great algorithms for, and then they work for everything. So you, so you optimize your few algorithms, really optimize them, and then, then everything else is just a projection of that. Yeah. I, 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 mean, it, you, I mean, you miss lots of people. You miss. What did I miss? Uh, <laughs> like when you when you deal with uh, well, certainly approximation changes. Approximation. On, on okay. These okay. issues. Um, Is that like quantum conjecture the, uh, theorem there was? Uh, like based on the new games or uh, uh, the event or. Right, but the point is, there's a lot of difference. Not all the same. And in heuristics world, there are obviously some problems which are. The degree of the polynomial for the projection. No, that's well. That's the key point. No, 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 no. So when we when we prove these, like if I want to prove it's a first sort of projection, I don't care what the arity is because it's just a clean result. But then when you want to actually do it, you would like these to be linear, you know, as best you can. And being linear, it's hard to make them for sort of projections and linear. They're, they're sort of going opposite directions. And I don't so much. What I care is that is that there's an easy, hopefully linear reduction. So that's what you really, really want. You want to optimize the algorithm and linear reduction. So, so, um, so Lance, uh, so you're saying there's a lot of times this doesn't hold. I was going to say, you know, heuristic for one. No, we have great heuristics for traveling salesmen. It doesn't carry over to right. another field, another entity. That's right. So now, is that, now why not? Is, there some, is that because complexity theorists haven't looked at that enough? Or is there really something fundamentally different? There's just a difference between the NP-completeness of our beautiful theory and the NP-completeness of how it's done in the real world. Right. So NP -com well, NP-completeness is just for decision problems. Then you, then you, tra you train the mapping for uh, approximation problems, and there's a little more to carry through, so it's less elegant. So it's harder to keep all this nice stuff going. What, what about uh, search problems? It should be a little bit neater than approximation. Mm -hmm. would, would this go through? So again, if you don't mind my finding each individual bit of the thing I'm searching for, then it then it does, right? Okay, so I, I don't want to take too much, but maybe I mean this is a great lunch or breakout discussion time because because for me, you know, at the one level, you know, there's only one problem in each thing. Why can't we use that a lot? And I think I think practically it really is true that this is why algorithms work so well because because you you know, write the algorithm once and you use it in many, many places. Um, and, and that's why all this stuff about complexity is, is really important, why we can really be interested in these complexity classes, because they come up, the problems come up all the time. You know, oh, this is p-complete, oh, this is nl-complete, this is np-complete, I understand it. And then approximation, if you care about approximation, which you should, then you have to go deeper, which I'm not doing here. But, but I'm advocating doing. Why, why is it uh, important that you have isomorphism? I mean, for your message that it's good to solve only one problem, it's enough to have a complete problem. Oh, that's absolutely true. That's so true. it's not the whole discussion, uh, you know. OK, OK. Yeah. Yeah, Once we have one complete problem, we can solve it, and the other reduce to it. So isomorphism is not really important. It doesn't matter that we have only one problem in the sense of isomorphism. <laughs> we just need one complete problem. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, well, no, I mean, there is. So that's true. You could concentrate on that. But then the question is, if, if there were really easier problems within the class, then you might say, well, I want a better algorithm for this problem. But what he's saying is if, you had a, if all the problems were actually isomorphic, not on what? Not everything. Well, all the complete, all the complete problems are isomorphic, right? The time for the reduction may be a polynomial blow up essential in reality. 
you can say, I mean, if you have completeness, you can concentrate on one problem, that problem, if you. Okay, okay. It's, it's still useful to, to identify. I'm not saying it's not useful, I'm just saying that it's very useful, it's very interesting, I sum of it. I'm just saying for the message that you yeah, need yeah, to no, work right. problems. Yeah, no, no, you're totally right. That just, all you need is one problem to solve. Um, yeah, there's something else, Mara, you know, again, for me, that there's, there really only is one problem. That's, you know, if you're talking about the only one complete problem for each, that's, but then, you know, you know, so why haven't I been looking at approximations more? I mean, obviously I should, but what people have been, why, you know, to what extent does this go through approximations? You know, we'd really like to know. Um, Okay, so, so thank you. This generated the kind of discussion I wanted. And of course, it's, you know, it's not true in general. So Ladner has this, has this automatic way of producing you know, bizarre, unnatural problems. So they do exist, but we don't, they don't, not in practice as far as we know. Dave? Well, I mean, there was this stream of papers between Bremer, Hartmanis, and you guys uh -huh. that was ex ex examining the circumstances under which the original conjecture so, so the, right. it was it was proved false under all sorts of different assumptions. And essentially, right. if you have a one-way function, you can come up with a encoded. Right, 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 right. right. It, it, so, right, right. So, but not for NP, as far as we know. But it was it was discussed. So, just yeah. There, there's some one-way assumption under which the original yeah, it's, but it's a very strong one-way function of which we have no natural examples. Okay. Right. Right. So there were, right. It was definitely looked at. You know, originally David Joseph and Paul Young, and then Steve Mahaney and Jim Royer looked at it. Um, so there's right. The question is, can you really, you know, mess up an NP-complete problem with with one-way functions enough that it it's no longer polynomial isomorphic, and what it really is, yeah, it, it's a way of, you actually have two problems which are uh, sort of accidentally isomorphic, essentially. You, you, you have like sat and the encoded sat. And they're, uh, they're isomorphic by some one-way polytime function. And, and then the first, the, the, the F order, first order projection can't ver verify them, and thus they're, they're not polytime isomorphic because of the one way function. And then the, but whether you have that one way, the right kind of one way function. Right, right, right. No, it's open. So it's just, so, so with these stronger, like polytime reductions, which from my mind was just an, a historical accident that that's what they were looking at, they're, they're rich enough that they're bizarre things that might be going on. If you go down for natural problems, they're already complete via these simple reductions, right. and it can happen. So that's, that's that's, so that's, yeah, that's my view, but there's room for a lot of discussion. And understanding, you know, for me, understanding why this dichotomy holds is, is really interesting. And for that, of course, there are these wonderful um, universal algebra methods that say, aha, there's only these sort of varieties that can exist. So there's only five of them, so that's, that's why there's only five problems that can happen. And so again, this is a really, really interesting issue, which I, I talk about in, you know, to my undergraduates in theory of computation, but I haven't heard it too much in the general setting. There's this phenomenon, to, so just tell me again, if you don't mind me using you, you know, to answer these questions I've always wondered about. Um, do you know that, why is it that, um, that your brain is, you know, is turning complete? You know, it was it was just evolutionarily designed to to you know let you survive in the wild, right? But as soon as it got complicated enough, it became turning complete. Are there any relationships between the type of language and the other um, asymmetric? So say it again. Relationships between type of language. if the language is type of and then the asymmetric conjecture is true. Oh, the compatible things are all polytime isomorphic. Um, so, so, so the patable is what proved it was polytime isomorphic. Um, so, 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 so the natural ones are all patable. Then there could be these weird ones lying around, but we're saying they don't occur too often. Is that is that getting at your question? Um, I want to know the connection between the first order isomorphism. And be compatible. So all everything. What this tells us in particular is that everything that's complete under first order projections, and in fact even more general 
reductions. Those things are all paddable. But if you're, is it true that if you're paddable via first order projection, then you're? If you're paddable via first order projections, then you're, then you're, isomorphic. you're isomorphic to these others. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but, so then I was just thinking about this other question about um, it's a different kind of dichotomy. You know, you're, you're trying to sign these languages and you add one little thing and then one little thing and then suddenly you're a Turing machine. So you have everything. And it's, it, it's a very quick jump. But I mean, you don't need the human brain. The ant or an amoeba is doing complete all this more stupid uh, cellular automaton like the game right. of life. Right. Mean, right. So Already it just means that you're incomplete if the, you know, the most natural thing on, on Earth. Right? So you don't need to evolve much. You need three states. That's right. You don't need very much, and suddenly you turn complete, which seems pretty remarkable to me. I don't know. Right. It's remarkable, but uh, when you understand it, it's not. Uh, uh, you, you, you're surprised at that. That are not human. <laughs> <laughs> Other than in our functions, are not human. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I think I think in some sense this relates a lot to the dichotomy phenomena. There's a similar kind of thing happening. There's only a couple of small steps until you're until you got everything. But no, it's, it's more complicated because that comes from me, and it's only for CSPs. I mean, oh, oh, right. We don't know. In, right. In many cases, that's right. So, so. You know, so basically, I'd like to understand this better, and you know, to what extent is it true, and, and what's really guiding this. And um, so, you want to know. You're looking at your problem. You want to know, is it hard or easy, and how do you configure that out? And you want to know why. And um, and again, for approximation, very often when you're approximating, you're finding that even though your problem is empty complete, what you're really looking at, you're really interested in a simpler problem that's sitting inside. So all these questions are say, how do you find out? <coughs> how do you find out the interesting problem that you really have to solve, and what makes it harder? Yeah. So that's I think what, that's what we do as complexity theorists. Anyway, um, so um, so I hadn't remembered this, but in 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 our paper there was this uh, little construction that says, okay, there's a there's a set which is, um, which is first order isomorphic to set, but not complete via projections. And the, and the way you do that is you just put a little extra thing in there that depends on two bits. You know, so it can't be computed by a projection. So it's just a trick, but, but it, what that means is, no, it's not the case that everything that's NP-complete via first order reductions is also NP-complete via projections. It just doesn't have to be the case, even though it's a for stupid reason. It still, it's still true for, for natural problems. And so after we prove this, um, um, and um, and I think, I think I was so pleased, I said, let's send it to JCM. And we did, and it got rejected. And the reason it got rejected is some people said, look, it's not really the analogy to the Berman Hermanus conjecture, because your reductions, namely for sort of projections, are weaker than your isomorphism, namely first order, because first order projection is a, is a real restriction. So, um, so can you fix that mismatch? And, um, and then in a later paper, Eric with, with Agarwal and Rudich did fix that. And um, I have like five minutes, is it? It takes 10 minutes. OK, OK, thanks. So then I, um, I'll talk about that a little bit. And um, so let me just mention, um, so they gave a nice clear definition for what's a nice complexity class. It's one that's closed under uniform NC1 reductions. So all, so basically you, you have to allow polynomial time blow-ups. So linear time is not a nice complexity class, but polynomial time is. And, um, and, and they proved two really nice theorems. One is an isomorphism theorem, which says that all sets complete for, for a, compl a nice complexity class C. So all our complexity classes are, are nice from now on for the rest of the talk. So all sets complete for, for C under, unfortunately, non-uniform or, or not strictly uniform. It could, this could be polynomial time uniform, but not, not the um, first order uniform. AC0 reductions are isomorphic under non-uniform um, AC0 isomorphisms. So if this was uniform, 
this would be the theorem we really wanted, that if you're complete for C under first order reductions, then you're isomorphic under first order isomorphisms. And Raminder Agarwal eventually got that. Oh, they have it for the first order. Oh, okay. Oh, well, thank you. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Well, fantastic. Um, so you can ignore a little bit of, there's a question mark. Does, can that be done? Oh, they did it. Great. I'll, I'll go read it. Thank you. So it's just, um, so one thing, you know, when I first met Eric, it was really clear that he was you know, really smart and really careful and, and had done his homework all the time, which I often had not done. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I really saw I should stick with him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's just, um, OK, so, that, so that's now known. So, um, so if I had a lot more time, I would tell you how that goes. But I don't know, I don't know yet how that goes. That's great. I'm glad. OK, so a lot of what I was going to say, I was going to sketch this proof. And I was like, I was, a lot of what I was going to say is, can we make this, can we get rid of the non-uniformity? And in my experience, whenever there's a polynomial time uniform thing that should really be a first order uniform, you can make it first order uniform. And there was a nice, um, there was a nice example of that. Like the one, there were these, this problem, which was the um, beam cook hoover problem, iterated, iterated multiplication, was known to be, it was known to be in bounded at threshold circuits, but not completely uniform. Um, and that was like the one example. And then um, a paper with my student Bill Hesse and, and Eric and, and David brought it down to first order. So there were no examples like that. And this was another sore thumb of something that was not quite uniform. And now it's uniform again. I'm really glad to hear it. So I'll go, you know, as soon as I can, I'll go read that paper thing. So, so basically, but let me just talk about this. So now it's, now we have a uniform with uh, isomorphism theorem. So all sets complete for C under first order reductions are, are first order isomorphic. Great. And um, so in this paper, they also proved this funny gap theorem, which says that um, if you're complete for C under non-uniform AC0 reductions, then you're in fact complete under non-uniform NC0 reductions. That goes through too? You have to be careful how you say it, but yeah. So how would you say it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's false if you try to state it for d log time uniformity, mm -hmm. but if you state it for first order uniformity, uh -huh. then it works. Cool. But then you're talking about uniform AC0, uniform MC0. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, you know, right. it's nice. <laughs> that's, no, that's great. OK, great. So, th so uh, there is a uniform version of this gap theorem, which has some details. Uh, so this is kind of amazing. Um, you know, the isomorphism theorem we wanted and, and the um, and this fact that as soon as you're first order, you, um, you complete under first order reductions, you complete under NC0 reductions. <laughs> Very strange, because NC0 obviously is much weaker than, than first order. You can't even look at the whole input. You can only look at a bounded number of bits of the input, and still it goes through. So it's kind of an amazing situation. Um, uh, half sub switching lemma is maybe less. Uh, if you know the Hustop switching lemma, then you'd be less amazed. Less amazed. I guess that's right. I guess that's right. So Hustop switching lemma really says, right, you can randomly reduce an AC zero circuit to an NC zero circuit, but, and then reading this, uh, how do you make that uniform though? Yeah, it's been, yeah, you know, well, somewhat it, from major but I'm surprised. So you can find the, land, the, the good restriction in AC zero. Yeah, the, the, no, that's fantastic. Yeah. You know. You've got a lot working in your favor when you're talking about a class that's closed. Sure, sure, yeah. So, so you can you yeah. can cook up things so that you can get it to work. So it's just and I just want to mention you know appreciating Eric's work is is that he's actually done the thing that I've often hoped for that when it could actually use the uniformity to prove lower bounds, which I, uh, I conjectured in my thesis perhaps that could be done, but, but Eric has actually done it and, and now this other work is doing it. So that's, um, there's this general notion that weak reductions exist and 
prove, it suffices to separate complexity classes to prove that certain weak reductions don't exist. So just show there's no for sort of projection from, um, from three colorability to directed reachability. Directed reachability is a complete problem for log space. I have S and T. It's a directed graph. So there's almost one edge coming out. Can I get from S to T? It's the stupidest problem in the world. You just walk and see if you get there. So it's not a very hard problem at all, but it's a hard problem for log space under first order projections. Click, you know, all the NP complete problems are complete under first order projections. So is there a first order projection from clique to um, directed reachability? Of course not. But if you prove that, you, you know, you get a Turing award. So it's, you know, it's a fun approach, which, um, okay, so anyway, I, I, I don't have time to tell you these proof ideas, which, um, which used Hasted's lemma. And uh, so, so for me, this isomorphism conjecture is true, and there's, Every nice complexity class only has one complete problem. There's this really interesting dichotomy phenomenon that has these algebraic and logical reasons um, to understanding them. Um, what, what do you say, not um, Oh, oh, you can make just that's Ladner's theorem. You can make bizarre problems in that NP. in NP and anywhere else. That just you can make you know like we have you know Ladner's theorem is like the axiom of choice. You can build horrible unmeasurable. If that properly reduces to G, there's something in between. Basically. Yeah, oh yeah. So there's some that are not in. Complete. So there's a right, but there's a dense there's a there's a dense hierarchy. So it's a, so there's this phenomenon that everything is here 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 here. That's our dichotomy. Okay, but, but in that in that sense, then factoring would be an example of something that's an NP, which we don't believe isomorphic. There are a couple of examples. Yeah, there are a couple of factoring is very natural. Okay. Right. Right. Well, what Lance is talking about is under what conditions are there NP complete sets under many one that are not complete under one? That's. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, that's a. That's a that's a related question, yeah, yeah, which, um, yeah, it's, of course it's open, um, and, and it's interesting to see these gaps, and <coughs> I'm sort of saying for these natural problems it doesn't occur, uh, anyway, okay, um, and this question which Eric answered, can we remove the uni non-uniformity, you know, I have to go read how, and that re-encourages these things I've tried to do long ago. Um, so I just, this is my last slide. So thank you very much to the organizers of this. It's been a great privilege to, to be here. And I, I, I hope you don't mind. Just, I gave the talk I wanted to talk, you know, learning from you guys. And, um, and congratulations to, to Eric and, and Mike. This has been uh, it was a real pleasure, like at the banquet last night, especially all the stories. Um, I have great, great, um, I don't know Mike as well. I have great admiration for, um, for the two of you. And keep, you know, keep up the good work. And I'm sorry, I can't get to the brunch tomorrow, but, but have, have fun. And I'm really struck by, by Mike's analogy to um, stale, stale hard bagels related to hard problems. I think it's, I mean, it's, a good, it's good to tell a student those are attractive, but you probably don't want to eat them right now. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's, that's I, um, but, um, you know, for most of you, I would say, you know, don't shy away too much from hard problems. It's, you know, especially after your tenure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, congratulations. Thanks very much. Any, any more questions? <laughs> so we have one. I just wonder for this. Uh, did anybody try to prove the isomorphism conjecture assuming these different than NP and no one-way functions? Yeah. yeah. People yeah. have tried. Yeah. 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 And there's you know, a lot that was found out about how far you can, can push that. Um, you know, Mahaney and Royer and Kurtz wrote uh, surveys that pretty well. And, and Steve Homer has done a lot there, too. You know. There are both of people that I can. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I would say I tried to raise the same question. From the the own considerations. I mean, the, yeah. I, yeah, okay. there are, that's the well, you know, there, there, are, there are degrees that are uh, where, where, where the, the isomorphism 
property does not hold yeah. length increasing and you know, yeah. assuming no one goes up. Okay, put the Okay. Thank you, Speaker, again.